وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين له بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى today we're going to be speaking about practical steps in which a person can take إن شاء الله تعالى to become very grounded and accurate and precise in knowledge. Every one of you here, inshallah ta'ala, you all want to be future scholars, inshallah ta'ala. It's a dream that we all have. And everything that we want to attain, there's always a way for it. There's a path that should be taken. If a person goes astray from that path or he deviates from that path, that individual will not attain, they will not achieve what they're looking for. Everything Allah Taala made a means for it, a way for it. If you go off from that path or that way, you're not going to receive, you're not going to gain and receive what you're looking for. So inshallah Taala, I don't want to start my lecture by talking about the virtue of knowledge and the virtue of the people of knowledge. Because I know that's well known by all of you. That's something that the Quran and the Sunnah have truly spoken about. But there is one statement or two that I want to bring to your attention, inshallah ta'ala. That are very powerful statements. The first statement is a statement said by none other than Al Imam Sufyan al Thawri, rahimahullah. Sufyan al Thawri, rahimahullah, he said a very powerful statement. And this statement of his is, he said, "Laysa amalun ba'd al faraid." He said, "Laysa amalun ba'd al faraid." That there is no action after the obligatory acts. There is no action after the oblig obligatory acts. Afdal min talab al ilm. That is greater than seeking knowledge. لَيْسَ عَمَلٌ There's no action. بَعْدَ الْفَرَائِضِ After the obligatory actions that is greater than what? That is greater than? That is greater than seeking knowledge. So this shows you that seeking knowledge is from what? مِنْ أَعْظَمِ الْقُرَبَاتِ وَالْعِبَادَاتِ بَعْدَ الْفَرَائِضِ After the obligatory acts, praying salah, zakah, Sawm, Hajj, and etc. After all of that which is obligatory on you, the first thing that comes is talab uh, al-ilm, seeking knowledge. And Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, he also said a, a, a very powerful statement. He said, "Al-ilm la yadiluhu shay' liman sahha kiniyatu." And Imam Ahmed said, "Al-ilm, knowledge." لا يعدله شيء. Nothing is equal to it. Knowledge, there's nothing equal to it. He said, but لمن صحت نيته. But for the person whose intention is what? But for the person whose intention is good, is correct. For anyone whose intention is is good and he has good motive and he has a good intention, that individual, there's no one like him. So anyone whose intention is sincere and he's learning this uh, knowledge for Allah Tabaraka wa Taala's sake, there's nothing like him. Or there's nothing like her. The reason why knowledge nothing is like it is because لأنه مفتاح because knowledge is the key to أبواب الخير doors of good. All of the doors of good, knowledge is the key to it. If you want to enter a door, you need a key. The key to it is knowledge. So those two statements really summarize and give you a final conclusion of the virtue of knowledge and the people of knowledge. So we won't go more into, into that aspect of speaking about the virtue of knowledge and the virtue of the scholars and, 
and etc. I know majority of you here have heard of these lectures and spoken about it before or even have memorized the ayat and the hadith that have come pertaining to that. But what we want to speak about is many people come and they seek knowledge. So many people are seeking knowledge. You see, Fulan, oh, I've come out, inshallah ta'ala, I want to be a student of knowledge. I'm learning the deen of Allah now. I'm, in, I'm, on, I'm on a path, I'm embarking on a path where I want to learn the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But 50 might start saying that, and you might come across 50 people. But a year or two, you see that only 10, 10 is left, and the other 40 have dropped. So the people who are remaining on that path of seeking knowledge are very, very, very little. But the ones who want to are very high. And do you know why the reason that is? Because a lot of the people heard of the virtue of knowledge and the virtue of the people of knowledge. They haven't heard of how to seek knowledge. So when they heard the virtue of knowledge, and they heard the virtue of the people of knowledge, it made those 50 people embark on this path. They said, really, this is the virtue that comes with it? This is how to seek, oh, wow, okay, if I get, if I learn, I'm going to, the intention and their heart went towards wanting to seek knowledge. But when they did go on, they didn't get the other part that was missing, which is how to seek knowledge, the way to learn. And so they spent a year or two in it, and then after that they dropped. So the people who are, يَسْتَمِرُونَ فِي طَلَبِهِ that are consistently seeking knowledge, are very little. Who are consistent upon it are very little. And those who love it though are large in number. So here inshallah ta'ala today we're going to speak about having that ability to seek knowledge and get to a very, very solid position in it. Not to just to be a person who seeks knowledge, who knows things here and there. Or who memorizes a hadith and here or there. Or who knows Masail, this one from there. Like, having accuracy and precision in knowledge is what we're talking about. So our lecture is about the following characteristics. How can one attain it? How can somebody have al fahmu wa sihatu tasawwur? How can somebody have understanding and a correct precision and a correct perception? of matters in the religion. I want to understand this issue. And not only do I want to understand it, I also want to have a correct perception of it. Fahmun ma'asihatu tasawwur. I don't want my perception to be wrong. Because knowledge, brothers, and seeking knowledge, it doesn't mean ma'rifatul masail wa hifduha. Knowing mas'ala, this mas'ala is wajib. Or this, it, and it doesn't also mean memorizing merely. It doesn't. It means al-fahmu, understanding. And it means that you've correctly perceived this issue. You've correctly understood what it means and what it's meant by it. And that comes, brothers, by learning the qawa'id, the foundations, the, the fundamentals. Learning principles. You're learning the usul and you're learning the qawa'id. The person gives more important brothers to the fundamentals and the foundations. This building that we're in right now, this building that we're in right now, the people that were making it, they took more time and effort making sure that the building stands on a strong foundation. The first have to look at the ground. Is this the type of ground that the building can be built on? Okay? Can you hold it? If the foundation of this building is weak, the building will collapse. However high it's built, your ittila and your reading of books and studying, getting, collecting books and having manuscripts and looking at them and knowing the authors and when they were born and when they died and even memorizing these books won't benefit you. If you haven't got what? If you're not, you've not understood it and your perception of these things are not accurate. There's, if there's no accuracy there. And that comes by what? Focusing on usulul ilm The foundation of the knowledge. The fundamentals and focusing on what? Qawa'idu. The principles. You take a principle. The reason why and the qawa'id the kulliyat, allati tatafarra minha juziyat. These sub branches they come. So you memorize one qa'ida. You know how many things come under this qa'ida? 50 things. You don't busy yourself with these 50 things. See, you just memorize this principle. 
Once you memorize this principle, it's 50, it can turn into 100 later. It can turn to 150 because nawazil and mustajaddat, contemporary things are happening, new things are coming. You're, you've memorized one principle and this principle is allowing you to bring so much things under it. The person is going to also receive having correct qiyas, analogy. Istimbat al-hukm sahih fil masail. The person will also be able to get a issue that's there and extract and derive the correct ruling out of this. With this also comes, brothers, raddil al-shubuhat. Doubts are going to come. People of doubt, people of deviation, whether it be believers or non-believers. The doubts that they put forward regarding Islam is vast and it's a lot. You would be able to refute those doubts حول المسائل العلم regarding knowledge and matters pertaining to it because you have what? You have a strong foundation. All of these people, what they're trying to do is they're trying to question the foundations. You've already got it. You have precision, you have accuracy in all of that. The person who doesn't do that, brothers, who just memorizes, who just reads books, who collects books, who goes to lessons, just listens to this, carries a heavy book, he's memorized these little mutun. That individual will contradict themselves a lot. You will see that same person, يُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ الْمُتَمَاثِلَيْنِ Two things that are the same, he's going to distinguish them in ruling. These two things are the same. You see him, he is going to give those two same things, two different rulings. And what does he also do? وَيَسْتَوِي بَيْنَ الْمُخْتَلِفَيْنِ And he's going to make the same two things that are different. He's going to give them the same ruling. That's a person. The reason why this problem has come to them is why? They have not got precision. They have no dabt in ilm. They also don't have al-fahmu wa sihatu tasawwur. They have no understanding of knowledge. And they also don't have a correct uh, perception of what they're talking about. So their foundation is very weak. They've got a weak foundation. And wallah, if you think, brothers, and look at today, the fatawat, the verdicts that are being given regarding the religion, and the rulings that are being passed, you will realize that majority of those who are giving those rulings and passing those fatwas are people who are far from knowing and understanding knowledge. They might know knowledge, but they haven't understood knowledge. They have ma'rifatul ilm, but they don't have fahmul ilm. They know knowledge, but they haven't understood knowledge. And there's a two, they are two different things. To know something and to understand something. And they definitely don't have sihatu tasawwur, correct precision. And with examples, inshaAllah ta'ala, I, I will show you so. So this lecture, of ours, the aim and the objective is to understand knowledge, to perceive it correctly. What are the practical steps in which we can take? Let me, inshallah ta'ala, give you ayat and ahadith and examples of the pious predecessors, how they knew the seriousness of understanding knowledge and having correct precision of it, how important it was to the Sahabas, how important it is in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said in Surah Al-Ankabut, Ayah 43, Allah says, وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَالُ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ وَمَا يَعْقِلُهَا إِلَّا الْعَالِمُونَ In this ayah, Allah says, وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَالُ And like that, we make parables. Amthal are parables, examples. Allah says, نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ Allah gives us amthal, parables. Allah then says, وَلَا يَعْقِلُهَا وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَالُ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ وَمَا يَعْقِلُهَا إِلَّا الْعَالِمُونَ And no one يَعْقِلُهَا إِلَّا الْعَالِمُونَ Except the people of knowledge. What does يَعْقِلُهَا actually mean? أَيْ لَا يَفْهَمُهَا إِلَّا الْعَالِمُونَ No one understand these, understands these parables except who? The alimun, the people of knowledge. So these parables that are being given, what do they require? Jazakallah khairan. These parables that are being given, what do they require? They require al-fahm, understanding. And Allah Taala says that many of the people don't understand it. Those people who understand it are the people of knowledge. A person of knowledge and a person of correct fahm will understand these parables in the Quran. What are parables, brothers? They are al-qawaid, wal-usul, wa kulliyat. Under Allah's parables are what? Principles. 
Not everybody understands them. It requires understanding. It doesn't require knowing it. It requires understanding from you. Look what Allah tells us. Allah tells us a story in the Quran. What does Allah do? In Surah Al-Anbiya, Allah tells us a story, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَدَاوُودَ وَسُلَيْمَانِ Dawood and Sulaiman, they are both what? A father and a, a father and a son. Wa Dawood wa Sulaiman, idh yahkumani fil harf. They were judging. A judgment was brought to the father Dawood, and that judgment was also brought to who? Sulaiman. Both of them, father and son. Somebody brought them a hukum, a ruling. Idh yahkumani fil harf. Idh nafashat fihi ghanam al qawm, wa kunna li hukmihim shahidin. The matter when it was brought to both of them, it's a long story. Sulaiman gave a uh, sorry, a Dawood gave a ruling in this particular uh, matter, and so did Sulaiman. Both of them gave a ruling in this particular issue. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells us that he only gave understanding to one of the two, not both of them. Look what Allah wa ta'ala says Wa Dawood wa Sulaiman wa Dawood wa Sulaiman idh yahkumani fil harth idh nafashat fihi ghanam al qawm wa kunna li hukmihim shahidin fafahamnaha Sulaiman. Sulaiman. We gave Sulaiman the understanding. Sulaiman was the one who understood this particular issue. But then Allah says, Both of them we gave them knowledge, but we gave understanding to Sulaiman. And then having knowledge, there can be a level higher than that which is al fahmu understanding it. A person can have wisdom, a person can have knowledge. But to understand something and to have sihatul tasawwur and a correct precision and a correct comprehension of this particular issue, that's a ziyadah, that's an additional thing. Sahih? Because Allah says, وَكُلَّنْ آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا We gave Dawood hukum. He had hukum. And he also had what? He also had ilm. And he had hikmah, he had wisdom, Dawood. Lakin Allah did not give him the understanding of this particular issue. He then, brothers, is al-fahm. وَصِحَةُ tasawwur. It's to understand and to have a correct precision in this particular issue, or a correct tasawwur, and perception of this particular issue. Also, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Yusuf, Allah says, Inna anzalna, we have sent down Muhammad. Allah is talking to the Messenger. Inna anzalna, we have sent this Quran down. Quran and Arabiya, we have sent this Quran in the Arabic language. We have sent this Quran in what language? We've sent it and we've chosen it to be in the Arabic language. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ So you could what? So you can understand it. Not so you can know it. So you can understand it. We sent the Quran in the Arabic language so you can have a correct understanding of it. وَصِحَةُ tasawwur, And you can correctly perceive it. In another ayah in Surah, Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, يُؤْتِ الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah gives wisdom to whoever He wishes. يُؤْتِ الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah gives wisdom to whoever He wishes. وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا And anyone who wisdom is given to, then they are truly being given. The person whose wisdom is being given to them. فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا This person has been given a lot of khair. A lot of good has been brought your way. If Allah gives you wisdom, then you have been given what brothers? A lot of khair. What did the noble companions and the people before, what did they say about this ayah? Abdullah ibn Abbas, Qatadat ibn Da'amat al-Sadusi, Bahak, and other than them, they said regarding this ayah, يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ يُؤْتِ الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah gives wisdom to whoever he wishes. Abdullah ibn Abbas, and Qatad, and Bahak, they said it means al-hikmah al-Qur'an. Wisdom means the Qur'an. وَالْفَهْمَ فِيهِ And understanding it. Hikmah means the Qur'an and understanding it. When Allah says, يُؤْتِ الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah gives wisdom to whoever He wishes. It means Allah gives you the understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Allah gives you the understanding of them. And if Allah does give you that, then you have truly been given a lot of good. You can look at Tafsir ibn Jarir al-Tabari and the Tafsir of Abd al-Razzaq ibn Hammam al-Sana'ani and Ma'alim al-Tanzeel al-Imam al-Baghawi and others. And as you all are well aware of, the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam made dua for who? Abdullah ibn Abbas. And what was the dua that he made for him? 
بأن يفقهه الله في الدين. الله gives him the understanding of the religion. أن الله تبارك وتعالى gives عبد الله بن عباس the interpretation. So what was the dua that the Prophet made for, for Ibn Abbas? Al-fiqh. Understanding. And ulama, they say there's a difference between al-fiqh and al-fahm. What's the difference? They say that fiqh means diqqatul fahmi. It means a more deeper meaning of understanding. Because you only use the word fiqh for something that requires observation. And it requires analyzing. That's what you use fiqh for. Whereas fam is used for, it's used for everything that anybody can come to understand it. For example, you don't say, فَقِهْتُ أَنَّ الْسَمَاءَ فَوْقَنَا I have come to know and have knowledge of that the sky is above us. Because it's something everybody knows. You could say if you want to though, فَهِمْتُ أَنَّ السَّمَاءَ فَوْقَنَا I know that the sky is above us. Fiqh requires not something that you need to look more into. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua. And he asked Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala to glow the face and to brighten the face of a group of people. Who are they? Pay attention. May Allah glow and brighten the face of a person. That person hears our hadith. The Prophet said this. May Allah brighten the face of a person. What day is this face going to be bright? The day of judgment. The days when the faces are going to be darkened and the faces are going to be Lighten, Allah is going to, some group of people, their faces are going to glow. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Nadbar Allahu, may Allah glow the face of a what? Imra'an a person. Sami'a minna hadith, and this person here is our hadith. This person, they hear the Prophet Sallallahu hadith. Fahafidahu, they memorize it. Hatta yuballighahu ghayruh. And they convey it to other than themselves. Hatta yuballighahu ghayrahu. And they convey it to other than themselves. They go and they give this hadith to somebody else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala glow the face of that person. Then the Prophet went on to say, hamili fiqhim. There could be a person who is carrying understanding. Ila man huwa min. He's carrying it. He's carrying this hadith. But he's carrying it to what? Somebody who has more understanding than this hadith than he has. You're bringing me information. You're bringing me a hadith I've probably never heard of. You're going to bring it to me and I have, I have a greater understanding method than this particular hadith that you're bringing me. وَرُبَّ حَامِلِ فِقْهٍ لَيْسَ And it could be a person who's carrying fiqh. He's got a hadith, a big powerful hadith with him. But he doesn't even understand what he's carrying. So what does this tell us brothers? This hadith Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah and Tirmidh and others narrated. That a person can be memorizing so many things but that doesn't necessarily mean that they understand what they've memorized. Ridalika, we see today, some people have memorized dictionaries, they've memorized so much, every time they talk, they have, they have so many things. That does not mean that they have understanding. That does not mean that they have what? Understanding something else. And having sihat or tasawwur of this issue, having a correct perception of this issue is something else. A different hold is a different, uh, as you guys call it, a different ball game. Then just what? Then just remember, then just under, then understanding. Look at Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the noble companion, Abu Bakr. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we know, Abu Bakr had the greatest understanding than anyone else. Sahih? Was there anyone who had more understanding than Abu then Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an, nobody did. No one did. An example. And this is a qa'idah that Ibn al-Qayyim mentions in Mukhtasar Sawa'iq al-Mursala, Ibn Taymiyyah mentions in his Bayan al-Dalil fi Butlan al-Tahalil, which is the more a person is closer to the Prophet's words and they are reading it and they are living by it, the more they understand it. The more a person spends time in it. And the more a person is closer to the Prophet, the more their understanding is greater. Abu, Abu Bakr was more closer to the Prophet than anybody else. So he knew when the Prophet spoke, why, when he said things, what he meant by it. When others couldn't understand it. And you know the famous story when the Prophet ﷺ, he said, 
ان عبدا اي سليف خيره الله بين ان يؤتيه من زهره الدنيا ما شاء وبين ما عنده فاختار ما عنده السليف the prophet is talking about a slave the prophet he said ان عبدا اي سليف خيره الله الله gave him a choice this slave was given a choice between what بين ان يؤتيه الله between Allah giving that person min zahrat dunya Allah is going to give them the glitters and the glamours of this dunya ma sha whatever Allah wills from it wa bayna ma indahu and what is with Allah either the dunya or that which is with Allah both faqtara ma indahu this slave chose what was with Allah over the dunya they said no to the dunya oh Allah I want what was with you when the Prophet said this, Abu Bakr started crying. All of the other companions who were sitting there, now did they hear the hadith? But did they have faham? Did they have tasawwur? Did they perceive it? Did they perceive what the Prophet was saying? But they memorized what the Prophet was saying? Did they all hear what the Prophet said? Did, did they understand the wording of what the Prophet was saying? Ah, oh, they all understood it. They all know what a slave is. They all know what Jannah is. They all know what Zahra to Dunya is. They know the Arabic language. But they didn't know who this slave was. That's fam. That is Sihat al Tasawwur. Abu Bakr just cried. When he cried, he said, Fadayna kabi abaina wa ummahatina. May our mothers and our fathers be sacrificed for your message of Allah. The other Sahabas, Abu Sa'id al Khudri, who narrated the hadith, he said, We were amazed. Why is Abu Bakr crying for? What's making him cry? Abdun khayyarahu Allah Bayna zahrati dunya Wa bayna ma inda Allah Fakhtara ma inda Allah A slave, Allah gave him the choice between his dunya and the hereafter and he chose the hereafter What is there to cry about? But then what was it that the Prophet and who was it the Prophet was speaking about? He was talking about himself It was him, he was trying to say to his companions I'm about to die Allah has given me a choice between living more in this world or dying and I've chosen to die I've chosen to meet Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. فَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ هُوَ الْمُخَيَّرِ The Prophet was the one who was given that choice. وَكَانَ This is what Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said. وَكَانَ أَبُو بَكَرْ هُوَ أَعْلَمَنَا بِهِ وَكَانَ أَبُو بَكَرْ أَبُو بَكَرْ وَزْ هُوَ أَعْلَمَ أَعْلَمَنَا بِهِ He was the most knowledgeable one when he came to the affairs of the Prophet. Look how he referred knowledge to him. Because he had understanding to the statement of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then the rest of the companions. This is what we're talking about here. Al-Fahmu wa sihatu tasawwur Having understanding and having a correct and a strong perception of matters. Umar radiallahu anhu wrote a letter, brothers. Umar radiallahu anhu, he wrote a letter to the noble companion Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And as you all are well aware of, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, Umar radiallahu anhu, what did he do? Qad wallahu ala ba'di nawahi al-Iraq. He made him in charge of some of the, of some of the, uh, uh, some parts of Iraq. He made it in charge of it, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. And he said, be in charge of it. And when he wrote the letter to him, the thing that he wrote in his letter to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, brothers, what was it? Al-Fahm, Al-Fahm. That's what he said to him. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, understand, understand. He said to him, what? Understand this issue, understand it. Why would he, what would he mean by Al-Fahm, Al-Fahm? Ay, ihris ala Al-Fahm. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, give importance to understanding. Ihris ala Fahm al-Masail. Give importance to understanding matters of the religion. Don't give importance to just memorizing things. Give importance to him. ولذلك علي بن أبي طالب رضي الله تعالى عنه. علي بن أبي طالب. They came to him and they asked him. They say to him, هل خصكم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بشيء? Did the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم did he specify something to you? Did he give you something unique? Because you're his. Huh? Did he give you something unique? Because you're the prophet's cousin. You're a family member. A person generally tells his family members things that he wouldn't tell the public. Is there something that the Prophet gave to you that he didn't give to anyone else? This was when the Shia were coming out, the Rafa that they were trying to get and say, Ali's he's got hidden knowledge that no one else knows. 
هل خصكم رسول الله how did the prophet specify you uniquely pass over to you a knowledge that he didn't give anybody else Ali straight away cut this fitna and he said لا nothing no and then he said والذي خلق الحبة وبارة وبارة النسمة I swear by Allah تبارك وتعالى who split the uh, seed I swear by that Lord Allah تبارك وتعالى the Prophet didn't give us anything إلا فهم من يؤتيه الله except though an understanding Allah gives عبدا a slave of his في كتاب in his book that's a different thing I'll, I might uniquely have an understanding of the ver of a verse that another companion may not have that's different but the Prophet didn't specify anything with us وَمَا فِي هَذِهِ الصَّحِيفَةِ and also there's a little scroll he had in his stick walking stick Ali in the middle of it he put it inside there and he said accept this scroll, uh, manuscript or this script so he brought it out and he read it on them which had three masail in there and that itself Ali brought it out so there's nothing Ali kept with himself but what concerns us from the story is that Ali ibn Abi Talib said when he asked him did something Prophet give you uniquely he said no except of course an understanding that uniquely was gifted by Allah to a slave over, over, over another and you all know the story of who? that took place between Ali ibn Abi Talib it took place between who? it took place between Ali ibn Abi Talib and Uthman ibn Affan as Ibn Abdul Barr brings it in his kitab at Tamheed which is what? that Ali ibn Abi Talib heard of a woman who gave birth and six months into her marriage this woman gave birth six months into her marriage she gave birth so her husband accused her of zina said you must have had intimacy with a man before I came into this marriage six months how can you give birth in six months that, that child's not mine so he took her to the court he took her to what? he took her to the court and when he brought her to the court she was put on a death sentence Ali ibn Abi Talib heard of the incident and Ali rushed he rushed to what? to Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu and when he rushed to him he said to him don't she's got a case there's an evidence in the Quran that supports a woman can give birth at six months a woman can give birth at six months and it's in the Quran so there's no reason for you to what? to assume that this woman had gone through fornication before marriage so Uthman being a person who memorized the Quran who knew the Quran you all know Uthman and how he was with the Quran صح? and how Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu was was Uthman ghaniyun ali ta'rif he's Uthman every Muslim should know who he is that being said but Uthman didn't know this issue Ali ibn Abi Talib then said to him the evidence to show that a woman can give birth in six months is in the Quran he said where is that in? he said what did Allah say in the Quran? وَوَصَيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ وَوَصَيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتُ أُمُّهُ كُرْهًا وَوَضَعَتُهُ كُرْهًا وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا 30 months the mother she is she's holding the child and she's also breastfeeding that's what the ayah says حَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ فِصَال means breastfeeding 30 months the Quran has already told us how long the breastfeeding is how many months is it? 24 months, it's 2 years وَالْوَالِدَاتِ يُرْضِعْنَ أَوْلَادَهُنَّ حَوْلَيْنِ كَامِلَيْنِ لِمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يُتِمَّ الرَّضَاعَ what's left after the two, 24 months? what's ever left after the breastfeeding is what? the pregnancy, right? 30 months subtract from it 24 how much are you left with? huh? 6 months, those 6 months are the 6 months that she's pregnant because the Quran said what did the Quran say? حمله وفصاله ثلاثون شهرا The pregnancy and the breastfeeding are 30 months Are we all together? If the, so let's look at the pregnancy uh, let's, let's look at the breastfeeding The breastfeeding is how long? 24 months, 2 years The Quran said والوالدات. The parents are what? يرضعن أولادهن حولين حولين is what? 2 years 2 years is how many months? 12 months, 12 months 
All together is what? All together is 24 months. 24 months is the breastfeeding. And all together the breastfeeding and the pregnancy is 30. So if we subtract 24 from it, how much are we left with? We're left, we're left with six months that are outstanding. Where does this six months head towards? It heads towards the pregnancy. Ali brought this out. It's called Dalala. Dalala to iqtiba. He had an istibat that he did from it, which later then got documented in the books of Usul al Fiqh and how to extract evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah. So the Sahabas, they knew Usul al Fiqh, which is a science that we're going to speak about later, which is the ability to extract rulings from the Quran and the Sunnah like that, and they used it when they needed it. Just like you don't have an umbrella every day, you only bring out your umbrella the day you need it, right? You bring it out when you need it, when it rains. You don't just carry an umbrella every time. The Sahabas, it was like that for them when it came to Usul al-Fiqh. They came out with their elements, they came out with the instrument, they came out with the ability when they needed it. And they needed to extract warnings from it. And then this is Faham. This is what? It's Al-Faham wa Sihatu Tasawwur. Having an understanding and a correct perception of a matter. This is what we want to work towards. And this is what we all want. Knowledge, brothers, is not memorizing books and memorizing text and memorizing things. It's actually understanding what you're memorizing. That's the asal. وَلِذَلِكَ الْإِمَامُ مَالِكٍ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ He said, إِنَّ الْعِلْمَ لَيْسَ بِكَثْرِ الرِّوَايَةِ Knowledge is not enhancing and being a person who memorizes so much narrations. That's not knowledge. إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمِ Knowledge is what? It is light that Allah places in a person's heart. That's what knowledge is. It's a light that Allah places in your heart. وَلِذَلِكَ أَحْمَدِ بْنُ صَالِحِ الْمِسْرِيُّ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ And he was from the what? وَمِنْ أَصْحَابِ مَالِكِمْ He was from the students of Mamalik. What did he say? Because he understood what Mamalik was trying to say. So he said that تَأْوِيلُ قَوْلِهِ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ The meaning of what he said, Malik رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمِ that Laysa Ilm Bikathar al Riwaya, that knowledge is not who, who narrates more. Knowledge is not who narrates more. He said what he meant by that is in al Ilm Laysa Laysa Bikathar al Riwaya, Yuridu bihi Fahm al Ilm. He was trying to say that knowledge is understanding it. And having what? Knowledge of its meaning. That's what he was trying to say. That's what knowledge is. Fahada huwa al Ilm, brothers. That is what knowledge is. Ibn Abd al rahimahullah, he said, وَالَّذِي عَلَيْهِ جَمَاعَةُ فُقَهَاء Ibn Abd al the great Maliki scholar, he said, وَالَّذِي عَلَيْهِ جَمَاعَةُ فُقَهَاء الْمُسْلِمِينَ That which the scholars are upon, a great large amount of scholars are upon, is ذَمُّ الْإِكْثَارِ دُونَ تَفَقُّهُ وَلَا تَدَبُّرُ It is, it is, it is, uh, it's spoken against. To increase in knowledge without understanding what you've already taken. And without actually pondering, pondering and contemplating over what you've already taken. It's not about how much quantity that you've taken. It's about the little that you've understood it. You're accurate on it. You've got precision on it. That's what they said is important. It's about understanding, having a correct perception of it. Al-Imam Al-Khatib Al-Baghdadi, what did he say? In al-ilm huwa al-fahm huwa al-diraya. Knowledge is understanding. It is perceiving it correctly. It is not increasing and going vast into what? Into narrations and different turuq and riwayat and the name of this man and this man. It's, that's not it. And the names of books, that's not it. It's Imam Ibn al Qayyim, he said, Fahm ni'matu min Allah. Ibn al Qayyim said that Faham. Is a ni'mah from Allah tabarak wa ta'ala ala abdihi on his slave. And it's a light Allah throws in the hearts of what? In the believers. And he places in their hearts. It's a light. Faham is a light. You see? Ya'rifu bih. And through it the person understands. Wa yudriku ma la yudriku ghayra. And he comes to know that which others don't know. The person starts to understand that which other many, many other people don't understand. Wa la ya'rifu. And other people don't come to know what it is. He comes to understand from the F, uh, text that which others can't understand from it. When they are all the same in memorization. 
He comes to understand from this text that which others don't understand from it. And they are all the same in memorization. And they are also the same in knowing the original meaning. They're all the same. But he has some extra, that upper. Just like Ali Nabi Talib and Uthman, they both are what? They memorize the Quran together. Did they not? Did they both not have Fahmu Asli Asli Ma'ana? Did they not know the Asal of the both of the verses? Did Ali uh, did Uthman not know the ayah in Surah Al Ahqaf? Did he not know that? Then did he not know the other ayah in Surah Al Baqarah that the breastfeeding for 20, is 24 months? Did he not know that? But no, it means that Ali ibn Abi Talib had an extra understanding which is to bring the two texts together and to come with this type of uh, extraction. Look what he then said, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, فَالْفَهْمُ عَنِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Having understanding from Allah and His Messenger. It's what? It's عِنْوَانُ الصِّدِّيقِيَّةِ It is the sign, it's the, it's the uh, heading and the topic, okay, of a person's Siddiqiyah, that this person is from the Siddiqin. وَمَنْشُورُ الْوِلَايَةِ This is what makes a person a leader over others, because he understands. وَفِيهِ تَفَاوَتَتْ مَرَاتِبُ الْعُلَمَاءِ And through this, even within the scholars, they're not the same. Just because one has an understanding more greater than the other, he has been taken and given upper hand. حَتَّى عُدَّ ألف بواحد. Until a thousand men have been made equal to one man. Look at Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Look at Shafi'i. Look at Malik. Look at Abu Hanifa. Why are they unique from the rest? الفهم الفهم يا إخوة. Understanding, understanding. Uh, many have come. But these four were unique in their understanding. Shafi'i rahimahullah, and Imam Malik rahimahullah, and Imam Abu Hanifa. And Imam, these are Imam, the reason why they were given is al-fahm. They understood the nusus al wahyain So that by themselves, by themselves they are equal to a thousand. Uh, you take Imam Muhammad, a thousand men he's equal to them uh, of his time or of his uh, era. And then this thousand brothers what? The matter is not increasing in memorization necessary. And it doesn't mean that you read a lot. And it doesn't mean that you gather books. It doesn't mean that. And it doesn't mean that that you're sitting there all day with different mashayikh. You're going to this sheikh's jalsa. And mashallah, you're going to this alim's dars. And you're going to Fawzan and Abdul Muhsin and Alan. And you go to all of the mashayikh. That doesn't, it doesn't show us anything. Or you even graduated from a jamia. Huh? And it says under the lecture, uh, it says under the, uh, under the uh, poster, and a graduate from the prestigious university, Medina. It, none of that. The matter is, brothers, what? Knowledge in its correct reality, its true essence is what? It means understanding. It means precision, accuracy. It means, as I said before, al fahm. And that would be known if you have it. How do others know that you have faham and you have sihatul tasawwur? Is when you have the two following. The following two brothers is an indication that this person has faham sihatul tasawwur. What is it, brothers? That this person has mastered usulul ilmi wa qawaidi. He has mastered the fundamentals. He has understood the principles. He knows the kulliyat. He knows the comprehensive evidences. He has the comprehensive principles. Which all of the sub-branches then come out. He knows that. That's number one. The second, brothers, is what? Is that this person He does not distinguish between two things that are the same. وَلَا يُسَوِّي he doesn't distinguish between two things that are different, uh, that are the same, sorry. And he doesn't make two different things the same. He doesn't do that. That's the second indication. That this person has al-fahmu wa sihatu tasawwur وَلِذَلِكَ وَاللَّهِ Brothers, when you look at مَثَلًا عَلَى عَلَّامَةِ Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymin and you listen to his fatawa, whether it be لِقَاء بَابِ maftuha or his fatawa نُورٌ عَلَى الدَّرْبْ and others. وَاللَّهِ تَتَعَجَّبْ you get very fascinated and shocked how he is a unique individual, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih Uthim. Reason is because he was an Imam. Allah gave him subhanahu wa ta'ala fahm, understanding. 
Shihatul Tasawwur. He, he truly understood this. I'm going to give you, insha'Allah ta'ala, some examples, bi'idhnillah al-kareem. So matters can become clear, insha'Allah ta'ala. But before I go into giving examples, what we have to understand, brothers, and we have to digest, is that the scholars, when you look at their books, and you read the books of the ulama, and you stand over it, you realize that the scholars, in their authorship, it's categorized into two. Their works are categorized into two, their authorship. The books that they wrote, the works that they've put together, the, the, it's categorized into two. Some of their works are based on what? at ta'seel wa taqeed What does it mean at ta'seel wa taqeed They are teaching you fundamentals, they are teaching you principles. Okay brothers, from these books you are learning principles. From these books you are learning qawa'id, foundations and usul, that's what you are learning from them. Kulliyat. Some of their books are like that. They give you principles. And in other books that you read from theirs is what? Min jihat tatbiq wa tanzil. What are they teaching you is the application of those theories now. Are we all together, brothers? So the other books, the second type of books, you learn from them tatbiq and tanzil. Application of those principles. Those same principles that you learned. Now applying them in the work and the reality that you're living in. The talibu ilm, the student of knowledge, cannot look at applications if he hasn't understood the ta'seelat and taqeelat. And if the talib ilm, the student of knowledge, he only, he only learns the ta'seelat, the principles, and he learns the, but he doesn't see how they apply it and when, what they use by it, he would fall short in that regard as well, right? The reason why he would is because he would think a principle of theirs is qa'idah muttarida. A principle that they've just given, it's a continuous principle, it applies everywhere. They will teach you that there are, there are exceptions. And you can only know that there are exceptions when you look at the application of that principle. So you're not going to confuse which qa'ida, which principle is continuous and what principle is used here and not used here. You're not going to learn that, you're not going to know that unless you what? And yes, unless you read their books that are written in what? At-Tatbiq wa tanzil Their books in which they apply things. أذكر لكم بعض الأمثلة as they say وبالمثالية تضح المقال I'm going, I'm going to now give you inshallah examples so this matter can become clear to you we nowadays nowadays we have this concept or this issue of التكفير والتبديع التكفير والتبديع تكفير means what? Taking a person out of the fold of Islam. And at tabdi' means taking a person out of the fold of what? Ahl sunnah You're taking a person out of the fold of Ahl sunnah We've seen extreme on both sides. At takfir, let's leave that for now. Let's go to the second one, which is what? Taking a person out of the fold of Ahl sunnah Saying this person what? He is not from Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. Knowledge should not be sought from this individual. This person should not be taken knowledge from. He's a deviated person. He's a corrupt person. We've seen extremism in this regard as well. And the reason why we've seen problems in these issues is because the reason is because عدم فهم العلم وحق وعدم فهم العلم وصحة تصوره. There's come a problem of not understanding knowledge and also not having a correct perception of this particular issue. The person hasn't perceived it properly, and due to that, what they've done is they've Easily just taking a person out of the fold of Ahl Sunnah. So ah, this person is an innovator. The extreme of the other side have come. The extremists are both. They always fall short on both sides. Either Al Ghulu in Ifrat or with Tafrit. They either go all overboard by taking a person out of the fold of Ahl Sunnah. Or another group of people who bring a person from innovator, an innovator, and they say he's from Ahl Sunnah. That's also another Ghulu. And the reason why both parties happen to come about is what? That they have no perception and there's no correct understanding of these principles that we are going to speak about inshaAllah ta'ala. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said the following. He said, وَالْبِدْعَةُ الَّتِي يُعَدُّ بِهَا الرَّجُلُ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْأَهْوَاءِ Ibn Taymiyyah said, the innovation 
The innovation in which a person would be called an innovator. He would be considered as an innovator. Pay attention to this. The innovation which we would say this person is an innovator. He left fold of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. He said it is what? Ay Ahlul Bid'ah. Mashtuhira in the Ahlul Ilmi. It has to be something that is famous amongst the people of knowledge. This person is not opposing a thing that's hidden. He's opposing something that is known by the people of knowledge. And he gave examples of those innovators, such as the innovation of the Khawarij and the innovator of the Rawafid and the Qadari and the Murji'ah. They are deviated groups. So the innovation in which a person would be categorized or even seen as an innovator, in which they are from the innovation that is well known, is the innovation of the Khawarij. That's very well known. The innovation of the Qadariyyah and others who oppose the Kitab and the Sunnah. For example, for example, this is what takes a person out of the fold of Ahl Sunnah, as Shaykh Islam Taymiyyah mentioned, something that's well known. It's not a matter that's khafi, hidden. It's a matter that's mushd, it's famous, it's common. It's known by the Quran, the Sunnah, and the Ijma'. So the Quran said it, the Sunnah said it, the Ijma'a said it. Not taking a person out of the fold of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah with what? Bizalla, a mistake that they did, or hafwa, or bifalta til lisan, or slip of the tongue. It's two different things, right? A person does a mistake, and a, short, a mistake occurs from him in terms of his speech. No one's denying that this is, is a mistake, but it should be kept as a mistake. As for saying that he left the fold of Ahl Sunnah based on this mistake that he did, or this shortcoming that he came with, it shows that you don't have fahmul ilm wadabtihi. You haven't perceived it. You have not got a precision of this knowledge. Another extreme is the groups that are well known, that are, as Shaykh Islam Taymi mentioned in his statement, that are well known to be innovation and innovators, is the group like the Asha'ira, for example. Asha'ira are they from Ahl Sunnah? Asha'ira are not from Ahl Sunnah. They are from Ahl Bid'ah. They're from the 72 groups. Are we all together? Bringing them into Ahl Sunnah and saying that Ahl Sunnah means three parties of people. They are Ahl Hadith, they are the Asha'ira, and they are the Maturidiya. And say three parties of people are from Ahl Sunnah. This is also another what? It's also Adamu Tabtil Ilmi wa Fahmi. You are not precise and accurate in your knowledge. And you're also not a person who perceives the issue properly. And you know why many people fall short on this particular issue like that? The reason is because. They've read some of the statements of the ulama who said that the Asha'ira are from Ahl Sunnah. And the person who said that is Shaykh Islam Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah said that the Asha'ira are from Ahl Sunnah. Did he not say that? He did. But when you read that statement and you have no fahmul ilm, and you don't have the correct perception, you're going to think Ibn Taymiyyah is speaking of it the way that you've understood it. When Ibn Taymiyyah said that, what did he mean? The term Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, I'm the word Ahl Sunnah, brothers, has itlaqani, it has two usages. Are you there, brothers? The word Ahl Sunnah has two, two types of usage. A usage which is am, a generic and general usage. And there's also a what? A specific type of usage. What's the general usage? The general usage is anybody who's not a Rafidi is from Ahl Sunnah. That's what Ibn Taymiyyah meant. That's the general type of usage of the word Ahl Sunnah. That anybody who, is, who believes in the following, he believes in, for example, the Khilafah of the three noble Sahabas, Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, he believes in that. He also believes in Allah's names and attributes. Sorry, he believes in those three, sorry, sorry. So he believes in those three only. This person, according to Ahl Sunnah, is what? Ahl Hadith, according to them, is what? Ahl Sunnah. They bring the person into Ahl Sunnah, they say, you're Ahl Sunnah now. Does that make sense? We, we even say that today. What do we say? Sunni and? We say, we call them Sunni, right? They come under the word Sunni for us. The Maturidi, the Asha'ira, the Mu'tazila, the Khawarij, they're all Sunnis. Are they not Sunnis? <coughs> they are Sunnis. We accept that term to be used for them. Sah? Are we all together? So calling them Ahl Sunnah is, is that usage. Does that make sense, brothers? There's another type of usage which is the Itlaqul Khas, the, the specific type of usage, which is what? 
which is that anybody who holds on to what Shaykh al Islam and mentioned in his Kitab Aqidatul Asatiya, or even more details, his Aqidatul uh, uh, in his Aqidah of Aqidatul Asatiya, good, okay, that's the Khulasa. Aqidatul Asatiya, what Shaykh al Islam and mentioned, affirming those things in there, that makes a. That's what, it, because it's at the beginning of his book, what does he say? That this is the belief of the what? The Firqatul Najiya, Ta'ifatul Mansura. He says that at the beginning. So he means this is the Itlaqul Khas. The specific type of usage. Are we all together? So some people will come and they would read the statements of the Ibn Taymiyyah or others which they refer to the Asha'ira and the Mu'tazila and the Khawarij and others as Ahl Sunnah co comparing them to what? When they're talking about the Rafidah they say all these are Ahl Sunnah but within Ahl Sunnah amongst themselves they take the Asha'ira out and they take the Mu'tazila out and they take the Khawarij out. Does that make sense? So the person has to know the itlaq al khasi and the itlaq al ammi, the general usage and the specific type of usages. And so this comes with what? It comes with a, pro a lot of problem. Another example is the issue of mudaharat. The issue of mudaharat, like protest and demonstration. The protest and the demonstration. Anybody who says, for example, protest is allowed, is it Ahl Bid'ah straight away? And then he's Ahl Sunnah? La. That's not the case. Naam. Mudaharat, protest and demonstrations is not part of Islam. No place in Islam for it. But the people who say it are two types. And you can't be unjust and make them all into one group. The reason why that comes is Adam al Fahmi, you don't understand the knowledge. Nor do you have Sihat al Tasawwur, your perception is wrong. A person might say that protesting and demonstration is allowed on the grounds that I'm going against an oppressive leader. This leader is an oppressive leader, I'm going against him. I know he's a Muslim, but he's an oppressive leader, so I'm going to go against him. I'm going to express my, I'm going to express my what? My voice. This goes against the Qa'id of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, which is As-Sabru ala Jawri ala Dhulmi al-Wulat. I'm a Jawri al-Aimatu al to be patient upon the leaders who are oppressive. The Prophet ﷺ told us to be patient with those two leaders and not to go against them. This person who says that has now gone against an asal min usul ahli sunnah that are mentioned in their books. Even Aqid Wasti mentions it. That you have to be patient upon what? The leaders which are oppressive. And you have to pray behind them. Walidhalika you see Abdullah ibn Umar having to pray behind some of the leaders who are drunk. Abdullah ibn Sa'ud prayed behind a leader, he was drunk, drunk, while he was drunk. And he looked at them, he led them Fajr four raka'ah. He looked back at Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and he said, shall I increase it for you? You want more? You want more raka'ah? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, since the day you came, we've always been in, we've always been in what? More and more raka'at. But he prayed behind him. And he commanded the people that they pray at their houses the correct salah. But they don't also not come out pray with him. They pray with him as well. To not show any disobedience. Because some of the leaders at the later times of the Islamic Khilaf, they were getting the Salah too late. So they would pray at home the right time. And they would come and still pray with him. The Sahabas would do that. Are we all together? The oppressive leader like that. And they would stop people from going against them. Another person would say, no, I don't believe that you should go against this leader. He's a Muslim. He's an oppressive leader, I know. Patience should be done. But he allowed it. The leader himself permitted demonstration. He said it's allowed. It's freedom of choice, democracy. Go out there, do it yourself. And he comes from that angle, we say this is wrong. Demonstration is not allowed. But this person does not become an innovator for that. Does that make sense? Because both of their statements are not the same. So this is, brothers, not making two people who've said two different things the same. Okay? And this is accuracy and precision in knowledge. I personally think if we go into the uh, practical points today, it will, be, uh, it will be a bit long. So can we postpone it for tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala? When I say tomorrow, I mean next Saturday and next Sunday. So we make Sunday the first. We, the practical side are two types. So we make Saturday the first type and we make Sunday the uh, second uh, examples and practical steps. And today we just leave it as a muqaddimah, as an introduction. Hey, Mara Yukum? What do you guys think? Huh? Some of you look fed up. Huh?
We'll do that. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illallah astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi.